Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest, I just want to remind you all about my Patreon. My Patreon is a place where you can go to not only support this podcast, but of course, get access to all kinds of special perks. Not only can you watch these interviews streamed live, but you can also access bonus content such as Q and A's. I also upload my fine art photography and BTS from those shoots. So there's so much on my Patreon that makes it absolutely worth it. You can join for as little as $5 a month. Go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered to learn more. All right, so let me introduce you to my guest. This is going to be a really interesting episode, guys. One of the things that fascinates the people the most about the adult industry is the money, specifically how much money performers can make. But as sex work becomes more and more mainstream, the money has become politicized, making it harder than ever for sex workers to actually get paid for their work. My guest today knows that experience all too well. After nine years in the industry and more than 30 pans from various financial companies, she's become a bit of an expert. She's a professional cam model and dominatrix who you may recognize from the Netflix Pornhub documentary, Money Shot. Welcome, Ali Knox. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This You're is so nice. Welcome. This is, I don't have to take my clothes off today, so this is very different. Than oh, <laughs> it's been. Oh, I mean, the show's not over yet. Okay. So, you know, I didn't tell you about the part at the end where everyone takes their clothes off. <laughs> that's the extra content. Yes, that's the extra content you can get on my Patreon. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't join my Patreon thinking you can get that. I don't do that. Sorry. <laughs> yes, you do not have to take your clothes off. The yeah. only thing that you have to reveal to us is the inner workings of your mind yes, today. I got it. And all your experience. You have it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start off um, how you got into the industry because we were kind of talking about this before the podcast started because that's actually how I met you. Yeah. So nine years ago next month, I started camming and I remember somebody came in my cam room. I had, I had gone to grad school and I had a shit ton of student loan debt. And so I started camming in the afternoons after my day job. And someone came in my cam room and they're like, listen, there's this new reality show. It's called The Sex Factor. It's to find the next big porn star. But they're going to have a bunch of porn stars on it and they're going to teach you how to do this adult business. And I was like, fuck yes. I want to go. I want to learn the things. I want the cheat codes of like who to work with, what not to do. Like I want all the education. So I signed up for this like crazy reality show. Um, I guess the, f the first round of filming I met you mm. – Maybe it was the second round of filming. I don't know. Met you. You came in and you did a photo shoot for us. Right. Yeah. And I won the photo shoot. Mm -hmm. um, it was for Hustler. And so then we went back and shot another one the next round of filming. And then it was pretty great. I, I, I really um, appreciated the advice that you had given me. You showed me how to find my light and how to hold my body and how to point my toes and my angles and all those things. And that was incredibly helpful to me going forward. Um, the, the show was a complete and utter shit show. It was, it, I mean, it was just it really from, was. from start to finish. It was just a joke. Nothing. I mean, it was a scam. None of the, the money wasn't real. Like nothing that they told us was real. Yeah. However, I met you and you taught me all the things and I got to skip through, you know, the gonzo porn or all the weird shit. And I got to go straight to glamour porn and work with people that were doing the best stuff. So yeah. I'm really thankful and, and very happy for that. Yeah. I mean, you definitely had a different introduction to the adult industry for sure, sure than most people do yeah and then I was also older I was like 29 coming into this I was all natural I wasn't really experienced like I had had sex with four men at this time like sex business I knew nothing I just I had I'd worked for Playboy before I knew I was cute I knew that men could talk to me easily um, and I knew I could make money off of this. Yeah. Yeah. Cause immediately when I started camming, I was making more than I was doing that I had gone to school for eight years for. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, the money's here. This is, this is my solution to getting out of debt, to supporting my family, to having a, a future that I wanted. Um, it just so happens that there's a lot of loopholes and shit you got to <laughs> jump through. I, I had no idea when I started this, I was like, I'm going to sell my titty pics. And I had no idea that I was going to you know, have to know all of these things and be cast out of all these systems. I had no idea that the financial discrimination in this business was so rampant. Yeah. And we're definitely going to get to that because that's such a big part of our conversation yeah. today. But I just want to get a little bit more into like your initial introduction into the adult industry. So people always want to hear about the first scene, right? Because that feels like such a pivotal moment in your life. Like this is the first time that you're having sex on camera in front of a bunch of strangers with someone that you probably don't know all that well. Take us through that experience. Okay. It was for the show. And I remember um, I had no idea of like the racism in the 
industry to where it was like, oh, we're going to film a BBC. So I, it was, it was another black contestant and they were like, okay, who's going to film with him? And I was like, I'll film with him, whatever. I had no idea that like people held out for that or Mm -hmm. they wanted their particular scene to be labeled as this. Mm -hmm. Like I had no idea. I was just like, I'll shoot with this guy. Like he's great. So I, I started to shoot a scene with him and he was incredibly nervous. Like there was no like consent talks. There were no, like, this is how you shoot a scene. There was nothing that there, there was no primer because he was one of the contestants he was one of the contestants i mean they literally opened the door to the hotel room and they were like we're going to turn the cameras on and so you know he was a young guy i was much older at the time and it was just like okay we're going to shoot this scene i had no idea how to do anything how to you know position yourself for lighting or anything and he was so nervous that he couldn't get it up of course. So Which is so normal, by the so way. Normal. I don't say like, of course, in the sense yeah. of like, right. you know what I mean? Like right. stupid guy, but like, right. I mean, that <laughs> that is a recipe for fucking disaster for me. <sighs> I remember, you know, like hearing that that's how the scenes were going to go. And in fact, like I experienced the same thing when, you know, I did my Playboy TV show because it was amateur couples. At least the people knew each other and were a couple together. But it was like two people who've never had sex on camera before having it together for the first time. And it's just like, it's always like, I mean, because it takes time to learn. I it know takes that- time to learn. And plus, there's a whole bunch of people in this room with you. Yeah. So it's not like you're just turning on your phone or whatever. There's, you know, there's a sound guy and a camera guy and the whole bunch of people are in there watching you do these things while lighting you tried to have this experience with a stranger that you just met. Yeah. Um, so he was very nervous. And I remember like going into the bathroom and he was crying and I was like, this is not how, all- oh, 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 it was terrible. And I was like, should I blow him to get him harder? Or while should I just While he's crying. Like, while he's crying, should I like talk him out of this? And he was just like, you know, I don't know how my mom's gonna feel. I mean, it was, just, he was going through the whole thing. I'm trying to film this scene, by the way. So we're in, in the bathroom and I remember just like looking up to God being like, is this, is this really how this is gonna go? Like, is this, my indoctrination to the adult industry oh yeah so that was a mess yeah this is my first scene so nothing ever happened obviously um i think we got about three minutes worth of content which i know they had to like repeat a bunch of content just to get the from two cameras just to get the footage like just absolute wait fucking disaster. so okay so hold <laughs> sorry sorry i don't and i don't mean to laugh because it's like this poor guy like i can only yeah. imagine and i've seen this happen many times it's such a humiliating experience. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a you know crazy experience for most people the first time, anyways. And so when you're not able to perform, and it sounds to me like there wasn't a lot of like good direction. Oh, there there's wasn't not like strong Zero. leadership no, there. Nothing. Like you need somebody who's in charge to like help guide you through these strange yeah. waters. Yeah, none of that. None of that happened. I remember just being like in the bathroom, being like, "Is this how my the course of my career is going to go?" Yeah, because if this is how I learn. And this is what I'm supposed to be learning? Is this what this is like? Like, yeah. I had no idea this was just a shit show and this is not how the industry works. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Because it was also, like, a show that was being run by a bunch of people who were not in the adult industry. They were not in the adult industry. No, they were a production company. And they yeah. didn't even put their name on it because it was so... Bad. Embarrassing to them. Yeah. 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 It was... So, okay. So, the footage that you got, what did you get? Like, how far did you get... <laughs> Hardly. I mean, I think he stayed hard a little. I think he got it in a tad. Um, but like that- he, he penetrated you. you can't ish. Remember. I think it was ish. I think it was enough to to get some content at least. I think it was just a lot of like, you know how we do these. You know how we have to. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. So I would have this experience a lot when I did this show and the guys would often not be able to get it up. That's pretty yeah. common. And so what we would do is we would, we would just say like, so then I'd have to come in and be like, it's okay. Like, try to, like, talk him down off the ledge. Because yeah. the poor guy would be right. so embarrassed. His girlfriend or wife would be embarrassed for him. Like, they're both embarrassed, right? So I'd have to, like, it was like a therapy session. Like, it's okay. Yeah, that's what it Most was like. people can't, you know, don't succeed the first try. So we're just going to do a soft core scene. And, like, nobody's going to know. In the edit, it's going to be yeah. fine. Yeah. And so then afterwards, we have to spend an hour filming this guy, like, slapping his limp dick against his what it was partner's like. vagina and we have to like frame it so we don't mm-hmm. see it and they have to pretend like they're into it the whole time in their heads knowing like we're doing it this way because we failed it was, like, it was pretty brutal it was pretty brutal yeah and at that time period I was just like is this what I want to do yeah. <laughs> yeah but I've already committed to this I'm already out there um yeah so Fuck. okay so obviously you stayed what I made you stay. stay in the show well I actually wanted the 
um, photo shoot with you. And I was told if I wanted to be in that photo shoot, I had to come back for the next round of filming. And mm -hmm. that was the reason I did it. I wanted Hustler. I wanted to work with you again. I saw that this was like, you had taught me so much in that one photo shoot that I was like, this is how I learn. The, these are the people that I that I thought I was getting myself into. This is what I do. Um, so I, I stayed on to shoot with you. And then the show is such a disaster that we all just started booking flights home. We were just like, we don't want to do this. Fuck this. And they ended up having to shoot the finale like weeks or earlier and cut a bunch of episodes just to get it done because we were all there because we were all fucking leaving. Yeah. Yeah. So that was um, essentially every single scene that I shot on that show was very similar to that, where it was mm -hmm. just like a complete and utter shit show. Just get fucking through this. Um, and then I got out into the porn industry and I started, you started booking me every round I came. You would book me for twisties or for your site. Um, I started working with Dean and I just, I just found the people that can make me feel pretty and make me, you know, teach me things and have a safe fucking safe spaces and work with people that I wanted to. And that was the porn that I thought I was getting into. Right. So I had made it through all the muck. Right. And yeah. I got to go straight to the cool stuff. So I'm really thankful that way. Yeah. And it kind of built my brand at the time. I, I remember I got a shit ton of followers. It was like, it was pretty publicized and marketed. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of, that, that was great. Yeah. Yeah. And so what are you doing now? I do a bunch of stuff now. I'm still in adult industry. I still have, you know, my OnlyFans and I make my content and my stupid little clips and mm -hmm. <laughs> the same thing that I've been doing forever. But I also, um, I work for a crypto company called Spank Chain and I consult for a variety of different crypto companies. Um, so I'm, I'm busy, but I think this is the story of like people in the adult industry. Now you were saying like you have all these different outlets where you have to put all your things. I think this is how we have to live our lives now yeah. is we, and, and plus I'm, I'm like whore for life. So this is what I'm going to do forever and ever. I'm proud of this. I'm out living my life as an adult star. Um, so this is it. I'm going to age into this. I'm not going anywhere else. So I have to find these types of things that are transitioning in the industry and just try to tie myself to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the great thing is, is that there's always like new opportunities in the adult yes. industry if you're smart enough That's to, right. to find them and, and your to reputation work is good is, is really, you know, I'm very protective of my brand and who I worked with. And I think that's been incredibly important. Yeah. 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 So, um, let's talk a little bit about your femdom. Okay. So can you explain to people what Findom is, um, how you get into that, and what your clientele is like, that kind of thing. Sure. So Findom is financial domination, which is essentially just dominating your finances. It's a lot more than that. Um, <laughs> obviously, I mean, when people are like, oh, that's cool. You just say, fuck you, pay me, and people pay you. Um, it's not really that. But it is part of that. There, there, there's a lot <laughs> there of videos. There is also that. There is, there's all, there is also that. Um, so I've been doing that since immediately. And I think it was because like, I'm just a dominant female. This is how I interacted with men. I realized early on that men love the power exchange with me. I have um, <laughs> a bit of autism. So I, I'm very like, I just say things very bluntly. Mm. So I can say hateful, weird shit that connect people, <laughs> that connect to people and the things and the kinks that they want to hear. Um, and I was just successful in it. I don't know. I never was really a submissive woman. So I don't know that I could ever have played that role. Mm -hmm. And this just, I just took off and it was who I was. And I also had a shih tzu at the time. And she was just a spoiled brat diva. And she did whatever she wanted at all times. Everything was about that dog. So in the beginning, I really like emulated my character on what would Bella do. So if, <laughs> if Bella would just ignore and be like, feed me, bitch. Like, that's how my character became. I swear to God. I swear I, to God. So you modeled, like, your porn <laughs> persona after your dog. Yes, because she was just such the diva. She was just such a spoiled brat, and everyone loved her, and everybody catered to her, and, like, the sun shined for her type of shit, and I was like, that's what I want. Like, I will just be Bella. We should be all more like a shih tzu. Right, right. It, well, it worked. I, I came into my own, and it just it felt good, and I could do it every day. Like, this wasn't a thing where I was, like, getting up and having to put the mask on mm -hmm. and play the character. It was just me. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to be able to be authentic. Oh, my God. It's, yeah. it's the only way I could withstand this in the industry, for right, sure. Right, yeah. So explain a little bit more for us about FinDom, because it is something that I feel like a lot of people misunderstand. You mentioned how people generally think it's like, oh, that's so easy to say, like, fuck you, pay me, and guys, like, throw money at you. But it's it's not that easy, and it's not that easy to find the right clientele that will actually pay you, right, and not just want to get off on you telling them to pay you and not pay you 
Yeah. If that makes sense. There's there's lots of time wasting in this industry, right? Because yeah. it's so oversaturated and it's it's the there's so many people in it or they're like, "Oh, okay, I'm going to keep my job, but I'm going to I'm going to stick my middle finger up and sell my middle finger pictures on on Twitter and maybe this will make me some money or I'm going to drop my cash app." And I think, you know, maybe sometimes you'll get somebody to pay you and you'll get really lucky, but this is mostly about like relationship management. This is about getting to know someone and taking over. And I think that financial domination is taking over their money and their finances because that's what controls most of us, right? Mm. Like this, for me, for sure. And I think this is why I've been successful is because I have such an unhealthy view of money and relationship with money in a completely different way where I'm like, I've been poor and I've been rich and I never want to be go back to being poor again because like just being, having your own money is just so empowering and freeing and you get to do so many things that you experience so many things that you never got to do. And I think that that controls so many people. So if I can take part of that and control the thing that's controlling them, that's pretty great. And control the thing that's controlling you too. It sounds control like. the things controlling me. Absolutely. God, Absolutely. So funny. It just makes me greedier and more hungry and more aggressive. And that was all incredibly important to my character. I was going to say that just feeds into yes. God, what like a interesting kind of cycle, uh -huh. right? Yes, it's and it's and I've been so controlled by money. Like I got into this because I was in debt, and I was able to make money and you know change my life and change my family's life and all those things. So I can see how that would be with someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, this is their focus. This is what they get up every single day for. None of us are like at our jobs because we want to be right. This yeah. is how we make our money. Um, so if something is controlling us that much, and I can feed into that. Like that's, it's, it's everything, right? It's so much power. It's so much control. And, and, you know, the, and this isn't, I'm not going out and I'm finding pe men in the grocery store. I'm mm -hmm. not sourcing them. I'm not hunting them down. Like everyone comes to me for this consensual exchange. Mm -hmm. There's never a time where I'm like, to, you know, take, sell all of your things. I want you to sell your wife's wedding ring. I want you to spend your college fund. Like, I don't want any of that shit. I want you to be very safe and smart with your money, but I'd prefer if you'd better yourself so you could make more money for me, right? Like this is a long-term game. So does this mean getting healthier, getting a second job, um, getting more education? Like it's bettering you to better me because everything is for me ultimately. And it's because I'm just a spoiled brat, but like this is who it, this is the character and myself. Wow, yeah. what an interesting way to like encourage people to climb this, the ladder, you know, like the corporate ladder or whatnot. Right. Cause I want to be in the wills, right? Like that's my ultimate goal. Wait, like seriously. I oh, yo. are you, wait, are you in people's wills? I'm in two right now. What? I'm working on my third. <laughs> yeah. Cause this is a long-term game for me. Like yeah. I, if, if I'm going to grow in this industry, I want somebody to pay me in 20 years. I don't give a shit about you buying my, my shoes or my dinner or whatever. Like I want you to buy my second house. I want you to, yeah. Because I need to know, you need to know that I'm going to be taken care of. So you need to work harder so this can perpetuate because that's all, this isn't just a short-term game. You want my life to be empowered indefinitely. So that's how you do it. Wow. Yeah. So do you ask for like proof of the I've seen one, one of them, I've seen proof and the other one, there's no goddamn doubt. And the third one I'm working on, there's going to be no doubt either. <laughs> yeah. Because I've had relationships with these people for almost nine years. Nine years, nine years, six years. Yeah. yeah. Have you met any of them in person? No, no, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So tell me. But I don't, I don't do real time. It just was a fluke, but whatever. Okay. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about these guys. Like, what are they like? Are okay. they married? Do they have family? And, and also like, how do you set those boundaries to make sure that they're not paying you in an unhealthy way? Um, so several things. Um, the, one and two are not married. They're divorced mm -hmm. and they're older. M the majority of my clientele is older. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of executives that are, you know, in leadership roles mm -hmm. and that's kind of freeing because then they get to come to me in this like sexual safe space and be submissive. Yeah. They want that type of, you know, switch. Yeah. Um, so I get a lot of like lawyers cause I'm constantly bitching about legislation. So I'm already catering mm -hmm. to that type okay. of thing. Um, older clientele that have been doing this for a long time and have been established, mostly divorced. Um, I get a few young because I have some crypto crowds. So I get a few young guys that are just like, I love to buy women's shoes or mm -hmm. I want a woman to, you know, take all of my money in this wallet, whatever. So I get those guys too. Um, it's, it's really just a mix. Yeah. Yeah. And then how do you ensure, okay. I mean, I mean like to the extent I suppose mm -hmm. that you can, like, do you ever get into a situation where you feel like this guy is giving you more than he's really capable of and do you ever have to have like that conversation of like look like I'm, I don't actually want you to spend it all of your money on me 
I don't know if I've gotten there because I'm pretty good about setting ground rules. Okay. Like I'm not very big on you going into debt or having to take out credit cards or to sell things or anything like that. I mean, I'll make those fucking videos or whatever. But my my relationships with people are not that. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to hurt so that I have to. I, I prefer that they sacrifice on their own consent, right? They are making an effort to sacrifice for me. So it's not where I'm saying you need to sell your car because I want new shoes. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you want me to have new shoes and you need to do the things that get you the money so that I can have the thing. There's never a time where I'm like, these are the rules that you have to follow to ruin your life so that I can have mine better. Because again, I want their lives to be better so that mine can be better. Right. And so I don't know. It's just like, it, there's a lot of just connection in, in, in chatting. And there's never a time where I'm like, how much do you have in your wallet? Because I want to take all of those things. Mm -hmm. It's more like a, how much do I need that you can pay me, that you can afford? And I, I don't know. And, and a lot of fin dumps aren't like that. A lot of them are like, I want you to go in debt. I want you to get the credit cards and stuff like that. But to me, that's not a, it's a shitty long term game, first of all. Because right. if I rob a man today, like. You're not going to be in his will. I'm not going to have his nothing will. left to that's give you. That's the fucking truth. <laughs> like, I'd rather empower him through this type of connection to where he really likes it. And this is, you know, consent is so fucking huge. I'm not going mm -hmm. out and soliciting anyone. They're all coming to me for this. Um, a majority of them will buy my videos, like the things that I'm saying, the fucking run on my bullshit and my awkwardness and all of the things and the connection that I have. And then they'll start ordering customs. So customs are a huge like foot in the door because then I make the exact type of content for them. Mm -hmm. And that's really good for me because then I'm learning what they like. Mm. So then I'm able to cater to them specifically with their own. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it just seems like. The, the way that I need to do this business long term. Yeah. Yeah. And so you said you have like three guys that are like kind of long term. I have a lot that are long term. Those are okay. the, the will guys. Those are the will yeah. guys. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, do you see a lot of them kind of come and go? Because I've spoken to other yeah. femdom women and, and I have had my own experience with um, a couple of guys that like came to me and wanted me to. And it was so weird for me too. I felt so awkward about it because I'm not like dom, dom like that. And so I was like, I don't know how to like ask you for your money, but I did it anyways. And this guy like sent me all this money over like a two day period. And then he just poof, yeah. vanished. It's very common. And there's, you know, this it's because it is so oversaturated. People get in and they're like, oh, I'm going to buy you some shoes and see how much like, attention I can get. Or I'm going to send you this cash app and see, you know, what, how you respond. Um, <laughs> that's not the game I'm playing, yeah. I guess. I don't know. I, it's just, I don't know. It's just different. It's just different. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think these guys are looking for when they come to you for this? Really con control and power. Um, they really don't, they want to give that to me as opposed to me taking it from them. Mm -hmm. I think that's been more my game is I, I don't ask for money. I want someone to give it to me because they want that for me. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been kind of a different approach for me that's a lot different than other femdoms that are like, you made $50 today. I want $51. Like that's mm -hmm. not my game. I'm like, you made $50 today. And I want you to get up in the morning and be like, I want to send her 50 bucks. I want her life to be enriched by this $50. I want to buy her Uber so she doesn't have to. Like I want people to go out of their way to focus on me. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a financial domination thing. It's a femdom thing. You know, this is, this is how they've lived their life. They want to serve. They want their goddess. They, you know, mm -hmm. um, but a lot come and go that don't last very long. I have a lot of really good long-termers that I've been able to keep. But I think it's because I have that long-term connection with them where I'm like, this is, I understand that you have bills or your, uh, a tornado ripped through your house this morning. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to go pressure you to pay me today, mm -hmm. but I want you to focus on paying me when you're back. Right. You know. Oh, so you're like a, you're like a kind, gentle. I don't know that I'm gentle and I don't know I'm kind, but I think I'm certainly more <laughs> understanding. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly reasonable. Okay. I'm certainly reasonable and rational. Um, I think that I, I understand where people are at and the things that they want, but it's, this is also like, this is also a kink. They're getting things out of this too. Yeah. But these are lifestyle guys. These are guys that live their life like this. You know, they've stopped drinking Starbucks so that they could afford to buy a custom mm -hmm. or they've start. they took on a second job so they could buy me things for my house or yeah, that type of shit. Interesting. Yeah. God, that's so interesting. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about money, but specifically about how money is affecting the sex work industry, um, legislation, all that kind of stuff. So hang tight. We'll be right back. We all know Adam and Eve is the one-stop shop for everything sexy. And now with my code Holly, you can get any one item for 50% off plus 10 free gifts. And you'll even get free shipping. 
So spice up your sex life at adamandeve.com, but only if you use code Holly. Hey everyone, we are back. Okay, so Ali, I mean, it's no secret to you or me or a lot of people who've been paying attention to this podcast that there is a ton of financial discrimination that the sex work industry is facing. So can you tell me a little bit about what you see to be the biggest problems? So right when I started camming, I opened up a PayPal. And I didn't know that PayPal, like, you know, there's no crash course in sex work where you just go and you get the pamphlet and it's like, oh, here you go to financial discrimination. These are the things you're going to face when you get in the sex industry. No idea. Um, so I opened up a PayPal and almost immediately got it shut down. And they sent me an email and they were like, you violated our terms of service. And I was like, that's whack as hell. I was just selling socks. Like, well, how is this? What? What the fuck? Um, and they said that I was selling a sexual service and they wouldn't allow it. And so then it, after that, it just started like Cash App, Venmo. I mean, just one after another. Google Wallet, everything that you could possibly imagine down. Um, and so somebody came into my camera and they said, let me tell you about this thing called crypto. And this, this is 2014. At the time, Bitcoin was like, I don't know, $350 or something like that. It was still like, crypto's a scam. Yeah. Like, this is only used by in the dark web. Like, you know, whatever. So fuck it, whatever. He taught me how to download Coinbase and I could hold my QR code up to my camera in my cam room and he could send me money through it and I could see it. And he was, I don't even, I don't, still to this day, I don't know who he is. I don't know where he's at. I don't know. Like, I I don't know. He, he didn't have to be like an American to send it to me. I have no idea where he is. Right. So he sends it to me and he teaches me how to do this. And the price started fluctuating. And I remember being like, oh, fuck, this is wild. Like, I didn't I didn't know any of this shit. Yeah. So I start taking it. I start taking it for Skype because I had no other payment option or I was running it through campsites, which were taking 50 percent of my income or clip sites were taking 40 percent of my income. There was no OnlyFans at the time. Um, and that's fucking insane because I was driving my own marketing. Uh, these were all my own clients, and I was having to use these campsites as a payment rail. I can't believe that campsites take 50%. 50%. Do they so, still do that? Fuck yeah, at least. Wow. It's insane. And cam is really tough, right? Because you got to be on all the time, and you're only making money when you're on cam. What, what, yeah. Yeah. So they're taking 50% of fuck this. So he taught me how to take uh, Bitcoin. I started watching it. I remember when it got up to $1,300, I wrote him on Snapchat, and I was like, do I sell? Like, what do I do? This is crazy. I'm rich. Like, oh, shit. Yeah. And he was like, no, nah, just hold on to it. Like, Bitcoin's going to be this thing. We're all going to hear about it, whatever. So I just started taking it because it was my only source. And I just started stacking because I didn't even know how to cash it out. Like, I don't know how the fuck all this math works. It's so fucking confusing. Coinbase at the only time was the only people. So this is 2015. Um, Showtimes comes through and they said, we want to film an episode of Darknet and we're trying to find sex workers that are using Bitcoin. So they contacted me. I did an episode for them and I showed my Coinbase QR code in my thing to the camera to show them like, this is how you can send me money. And the episode debuted in 2016 and the next day Coinbase shut my account down. <gasps> and they sent me an email and they were like, listen, you violated the terms of service. You can't sell sexual service. And I was like, but this is fucking crypto. Crypto is censorshipless and crypto is permissionless how fucking dare you people that was like the whole point that's the whole point of why i'm taking this is because you can't do this and they're like ah sorry bitch you're out so i'm like what this 2016 i'm like what the fuck so i start opening burner wallets and all the things that crypto kids do but i mean so to be fair like yeah coinbase is just so people aren't confused coinbase is a platform that you're using to access the crypto and store the crypto it's not crypto itself so she hasn't lost the money right She's i didn't just lose lost it. the access that's to right. the money at the time. And I was able to take it out. I mean, it took like a week to, to finagle everything. Yes, I, I, didn't, I didn't lose my crypto, yeah. but I lost the platform. And at the time, Coinbase was the, one of the only places that was working and yeah. working as an exchange. So if I ever wanted to take my money out, like being banned from Coinbase is very fucking problematic. Yeah. So and wait, they banned you. you like, had you never taken any money out yet? Or had you taken some out? I had moved things to wallets, but I don't think that I had gone through the exchange, no. Because Coinbase was working as an exchange and a wallet at the time. I don't think I had taken anything out at this time. So were you even spending any of this money that you're spending all this time making? Or were you just like thinking, I'm saving this? I didn't even know how to move it out. <laughs> like it was, it was a, conf it was, this was so confusing. This yeah. is still 2016. Like yeah. there was not, there's not information. There's still not information out there. Yeah, yeah. There was not information out there. I think I was storing it. I want to say a couple of times I took something out just to test it in case I needed it. But I think I was just racking. Mm -hmm. I think I was putting in different wallets. I was losing wallets. I didn't, I forgot. Pro I mean, it, you know, the, every person's <laughs> crypto experience, yeah, I had it, right? I was sending them to wrong places. I was using it to buy things. I was using it to tip. 
I was using it to, to tip sex workers. And I was using it to buy weed on the internet. And that, you know, it's funny because they're just like, ah, oh, it's just for sex and drugs. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of true. I did use it for that. I couldn't buy anything else. Like I couldn't buy pizza or pay my rent or whatever. Yeah. So I was just, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I was buying weed, <laughs> whatever. So... So spent hardly any of it, kept cashing, whatever, kept, kept running it in different wallets, moving it around. Um, and then I started talking about this and I went on Peter McCormick's podcast, which you've been on. Yes. Yeah. I actually sent he's Peter lovely. to you. Yes, you did. Yeah. He's so really nice. I went on his it's called, um, he's not really nice. He's a big asshole. I would hate him. He's oh. a total asshole, but he's really good at stuff. His podcast is great. Oh yeah. <laughs> he sent me a dress for my daughter when she was born. I don't know. Yeah. He can be kind, but yeah. It's called what Bitcoin did was the yes. podcast, right? And yeah. it's an, it's an excellent podcast and a ton of information. So I did the podcast with Peter, um, and I started getting crypto clientele. And people started taking me seriously as, as a crypto spokesperson. And I was like, oh, shit, maybe this is something I could look into because nobody's telling people how to how to run their money. Yeah. Like this information isn't even here. And so he accidentally, which he would hate, legitimized me in that podcast. And so I, um, to, this is like 2016, 17, there was a company called Spank Chain and they were going through ICO because at the time they had ICO still. And they were a crypto wallet and pl payment platform for sex workers. They were going to stand behind the sex workers. They weren't going to be, you weren't going to be able to have your account shut down. Like they were the company that was like, fuck this. We are going to help the whores. So I, I saw that they were ICOing. So I wrote a job description and I emailed it to the CEO and I said, I want you to hire me. And this is what I want to do. And he wrote me back and said, and I said, if not, I have a big ass and you can use me for promo. And he wrote me back immediately and he said, a big ass, you say? And he hired me the next day. So <laughs> I've been with them since. I guess that was like almost six years ago. Wow. Yeah. And so we started building a crypto platform for sex workers. We built a cam site first and then crypto went all to shit. The, mm -hmm. the crash happened. Um, and we started building a payment app until this year in um, January our third port party um, exchange, which means you could take your crypto and you could flip it in the wallet and you could just bring fiat cash out uh -huh. and you can put it back into your bank account. Our third party exchange that we built on um, kicked us out. They were wire wow. and they were going through, um, they, are, they now are a defunct company, but they were bought out by another, or they were partnered with another company that didn't allow um, any service to us anymore. And we had built on their product and we had been on there for two and a half years. We had never had a violation. We had never had a problem. We had a great... Um, relationship with Wire, and they came through and said, listen, we've partnered with Checkout.com. They don't like adult. You guys are out. So we had to shut our product down. So now we're scrambling to still have a third-party option because nobody's doing this. Like, people are building it. They're constantly getting shut down. So we're going to try our hardest because we still need this. Like, I, this, th I still believe in this. This is why I joined this company is because sex workers still need to be treated fairly. Yeah. Um, all of my work is legal. Everything is done online. Like, for the reasons that I'm cast out of this is because they just don't like it right like this yeah. is just a, a a narrative that we are high risk where the data doesn't actually reflect this um so i talk about this a lot and last two years ago maybe i was in um, an article and i was bitching about this whole thing and a lobbyist wrote me and said listen i think that i can help you i worked in cannabis before this and i was able to get them payment processing i think there's a big market like a big opportunity here and i'm trying to get it back on the financial banking committee this would be a good win for me would you meet with me so I met with him and he was great. His name is Pierre and he's fucking wonderful. And so I sent him to the FSC and he's been working with them for over a year. We've gone to um, DC twice and we're trying to lobby for financial, uh, no financial discrimination in any legal industry because we can't write it to where it's like the whores need rights too, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. nobody's going to go for that. However, the Republicans have already dealt with this with guns and oil. So they've already seen how, you know, these companies are discriminated against or the, the people that work for them. Um, and then the Dems, like, you know, they, they want the marginalized to be represented and they mm -hmm. have experiences through cannabis. So we're having both sides agree with us and stand, support us. So if we can't get tied to a bill, we're going to write our own. And it'll wow. essentially be that no legal business can experience any type of financial discrimination. Which, um, which feels like fucking it, huge. Which feels like it makes sense. Which feels like it makes sense. It's only fair, right? I mean, it sounds like it would make so much sense for, you know, financial institutions to support legal businesses. And in fact, when I've talked about the financial discrimination that the adult industry faces to, you know, the regular layman, they're like, well, how could they do that? How right. could they shut down your bank right. account? 
like that that's not fair that's discrimination i'm like yeah but if you look at the small print banks are private institutions yeah. so technically they can discriminate however they want right until a law is written right yes, until a law right. is written um but the thing is is that you know and obviously if you were they were to discriminate against like a race or you know gender or something like that which you know obviously has happened in the past um that wouldn't be okay with anybody but it's been very difficult up until now and i hope i see the trend changing for anybody to rally for sex workers because it's just like oh well you made your own bed lie in it and you're all degenerate whores and you yeah. deserve everything that you're that is coming your way and it's yeah like, and 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 I, to to, to add to that, the people that we were meeting with, they believe that, right? Like they don't want to stand behind the horse, but they also like see that this is a, you know, a fucking problem. It leads to really sh like my own personal story is I, as of two months ago, I've had 36 accounts shut down between social and payment apps. I made a funeral for them. I made a little graveyard <laughs> for each. Yeah. Little tombstones for each account and like did my little photo shoot with my flowers and shit in my black dress. Oh yeah. Like I'm going to fucking ride on this shit. Right. Like anything I can monetize in my life. That's what I'm doing. Right. You know, whacked off or whatever. Um, but it was also like, I lose that content. I lose that community. Like I use, I lose all these things. And I'm never violating mm -hmm. any, any terms of service. I'm selling my socks. I'm not nude. I'm overage. My TikTok went down, um, for being a nude minor. Well, I'm 38. I've never taken my clothes off on TikTok or gotten any clothes. Uh, the video that got me uh, suspended, I was in sweatpants. Um, and I, you know, I go to appeal and it's immediately denied and I lost all, you know, all my good. And they won't let you, and they won't oh, talk to you. They won't even talk to me. Yeah. They won't even talk to me. Um, I luckily got my username back after a year, but you know, it's just been a whole fucking fight in, in every platform I have, I have that same story. My Instagram, I'm on my third one. I mean, there's just everything. It's yeah. just always a fucking battle. So not only is this money, right? This is also our social, our, our community, but it also lends like this is my business. Now I have to start over with that content. I have to start over with my community building. Like this is, this is not to mention the income that it's already doing. Yeah. Um, so in addition to all of that bullshit, I couldn't get a mortgage and I make very good money. I had money that I was putting down. I was building a home and my mortgage company was like, listen, we don't like what you do. You have the, you have your 1099s and all of your IRS stuff for years that prove that this is a viable business, but we don't really like it, right? And they can do this. Mm -hmm. They don't have to have facts or data and they can call us high risk even though that the data and the facts don't show that. Um, it's just this narrative that they run on. So they wouldn't let me on it. So I had to get married to get a fucking mortgage, which is a real problem when you're trying to get divorced. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a real issue because I had to put my husband's name on my house and my cars and my electric bill. I mean, all the things that I have to be legitimate on paper, I had to put in his name and now we aren't together anymore. So trying to get things in my name have been a real fucking hassle. Been wow. a, Oh yeah. It's been a goddamn nightmare. Wow. Yeah. So I've been divorcing for three years now, just yeah. trying to keep the things that are mine. Yeah. Yeah. That's so insane. Yeah. It's insane. I mean, you know, we all, I feel like everybody in the adult industry has their, you know, financial discrimination mm -hmm. story. In fact, um, the FSC just published uh, data that two thirds of sex workers have lost access to either a bank or a financial service, while 40% uh, have had an account closed within the past year. And we were, you know, talking about this earlier and, you know, I run a business and to be compliant with the California state law, I applied for workers comp because you have, have to, to have that yeah. as a, you know, employer in California. And I got, um, approved, you know, through Hartford and I had workers comp with them for like two months and then they sent me a letter and they, yeah, they, they found out what I did for a living and they shut me down because I'm like a high risk industry. And I'm like, I'm just trying to like abide by the law right. and like cover my employees in case one of them gets hurt. I'm literally trying to like run right. a small business by the way I'm supposed to. I'm trying to be legitimate. I'm trying to be a good citizen. And like y'all fuckers won't let me. They won't let you. And so, you know, you get into these positions to where the feds came and knocked at my door because they were wondering why everything was in my husband's name and all the money was being run through his accounts. And it's like, you put me in a box, bro. And now you're pissed because I'm operating the box. So now, you know, that was a two and a half year IRS investigation that I had to go through and spend. I don't even want to tell you how much money just to survive the audit that I was, you know, it, they, they ended up finding I actually overpaid and had to send me a check back for 
just fucked, right? But I mean, they sent agents to my house to question me for two hours about this entire thing. And it's like, they were pissed because I was operating the box, but I'm just trying to follow the rules, bro. Like, I won't, I won't lie. They subpoenaed me for my I know they do. You. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Everybody got subpoenas. I got, yes. <laughs> I know. That's nuts. Yes. I didn't know what was going on, yes. but that's, that makes sense. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. I know. God. And that's how I knew is because people I was friends with and I was working for were like, listen, bitch, you got subpoenas out everywhere. I was like, oh, really? That's weird. And then I get off the plane and my brother's like, the feds are out the door. So I have to like drive home and have this interview with these two federal agents who go through my last seven years of all of my income wondering, why is your house in your husband's name, but it's all your money? And I'm like, you guys did this. Like, I'm just trying to live, bro. I'm just trying to have a house. What was their reaction to that? Did they like, did they seem like they were sympathetic or did they seem confused? Yeah, you know, or... actually, I, I hate to like give credit to, to, <laughs> to, to the IRS, but they were actually kind of cool because they, I mean, they, they sat down and they weren't like super accusatory and they were asking me questions about the things. And I have all my paperwork because I've gone through this forever and mm -hmm. ever. And they were actually kind of understanding and I didn't have a lot of problems after this, but now I'm targeted. I'm going to have a red flag on my back forever and ever. I have a whole list of lawyers on my docket that I pay all the time. I mean, it's just, it's costing me a fortune just to live this life. Yeah. That's why you need to be finned on. This is why I'm a fin dog. This is why This guys... is why, because my relationship with money, Holly, this is what it keeps doing. It just keeps me getting deeper and deeper in this like greediness. I need more because I'm, I'm, I need more. Like I yeah. have to have more to survive now. Yeah. Yeah. God, that is wild. It is wild. And now I'm 38 and I don't talk about this a lot, but now I'm 38. I'm at the end of my childbearing years. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, I have to have a kid. Like if I'm going to have a kid, it's now or never. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried because how do I know I'm going to have a bank account next? Or how do I know I'm going to be able to buy a car or get another house loan? Am I going to have to get married again just to buy a car or to buy a house? Or am I going to have to pay cash in every single thing? Like how do I know that my child's future is going to be stable if how I... Yeah, so I don't. Up an account for so your I've been putting this college fund. I swear to God, I've been putting off this childbearing for all this time until I felt like I was a place where I could be stable on paper, and I'm nowhere near, and I'm out of time. So fuck. That is so sad too, because yeah, you know a lot of people put um, off having a child until they're financially stable, but it's not the kind of financially stable situation that you're looking at. You know, they're trying to make enough money, get high enough in their career where they feel like they're making a salary they can support a child. You're making the money, yep. but you want to be at a place in your life where you feel like your money isn't going to be taken from you. That's right. Or I'm going to have to jump through hoops to get it, or I'm going to have to move all of my money different places. I mean, it's just, yeah, that is that's wild. right. It's wild and it's awful because I'm out of time. I have to do something now. So I neither have to have a kid and live in this like unstable fucking existence mm -hmm. or things change. Yeah. So that's where I'm going with this things change. This is why I'm plugging FSC all the fucking time because they're doing really good work yeah. for us. They are putting so much of their time and effort into saving our asses. Um, and so that's where I'm going. I have to fix this law if I want anything to be changed. So that's what I've determined to do. Yeah. 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 And, you know, before we started this podcast, we actually recorded a PSA where I talk about um, basically – blocking children's access to porn on your device so that these crazy laws that they're trying to pass, um, basically making it impossible for porn sites to comply, um, don't exist. Can you tell us a little bit about some of these laws that we're yeah. facing right now? So these age verification laws are coming through and FSC is suing every state that, that has this happen. And I'm glad, thank God that someone is, some industry is standing behind us and going to fight for our rights. Um, so these laws are essentially built to say that you would have to, instead of, you know how you go to buy beer and you have to flash your ID to the attendant and he just puts in your number. Well, this isn't that. This isn't like you're just flashing your ID. You have to put it into a database and it's maybe a third party database that's keeping your um, content. Who knows where, who knows where your data is going, if it's being sold, if it's being stored, if it's hackable, who the fuck knows, right? So all of that information is going into these third party databases and they're giving a check. They're saying, yes, the ID passed. No, the ID didn't. So if you are over age, and your ID pass and you can visit this site. Well, it's just crazy because some of these sites, 
some of these states that have written this law don't even have these infrastructures. So it's like they're saying you have to use your digital ID. Well, some of these states don't even have digital IDs. So it's like, how can you conform to this? I mean, it's, right. this is actually just the narrative that they're saying is we want to protect the children. Well, that's bullshit, right? Like we want to protect the children. That's why we were like, this is how you can put a filter on your device. We don't want children seeing our content. I don't want them seeing my content. I don't want them seeing your content. I They should be age appropriate content that the parent decides because I don't want to parent your child. I don't want to teach your kids sex education. Like none of these things are for children. I don't, they can't pay me. Children can't pay me. <laughs> why do I want children on my site, you yeah. know, or anyone's site? So there's ways around these laws that are just bare, very fucking poorly written and they're not you can't comply with and that's mm -hmm. a real fucking problem when we're all trying to do the things by the book but we're shut off to these you know regulations yeah yeah and the thing is too is that it's so easy you know if you're especially if you're not divulging all of the information and all of these problems that you just mentioned it's so easy to get people behind like that's blocking right. access that's to right. porn, child porn because like again nobody wants that right. everyone can get behind yeah. that but you know, like people are just getting so much misinformation yes. in terms of what these laws are doing. And you know, another point too is like, okay, all of these legitimate websites, you know, like real industries are trying to comply with these laws or blocking access. And so that leaves all of these kind of underground websites, yes. the dark web, That's so right. to so so to say, you know not complying yep. and so like you can where people are hurting right and yeah. so you, then you can find what you're looking for and and more that you know shouldn't be out there on these other websites yeah and that's really terrible to direct traffic to the underground yeah because it's not like people are going to just be like oh fine fuck it i can't access it they're going to find a way around it and it's going to be an unsafer way mm -hmm. yeah yeah you just drive it underground and right. it becomes like a real problem mm -hmm. so um you were in the uh Netflix documentary Money Shot. Um, tell us a little bit about how that came about and what that experience was like. Sure. So I bitch about this a lot. I bitch about this or Foster Sester or any of the legislation that comes through just because this this affects us, every single one of us, how we speak on the internet, um, to how we have our accounts, how we run our money, all the things. Um, so I'm talking about this and I, I guess they saw my Twitter, me bitching or an interview or something. And they emailed me and they said, listen, we're doing this documentary called The Future of Porn. And we want to talk about the different technologies that are happening. So I, they came to Vegas and interviewed me for a couple of days. And I talked mostly about like legislation. I talked about how FOSTA SESTA has created a bunch of censorship and how um, this, these money regulations <laughs> are just insane. I talked about my experience with the IRS and with crypto and all the things. And they ended up using just a very short blurb where I'm bitching about FOSTA SESTA. I'm like, this is a poorly written law. Even the DOJ has come out and say, listen, this didn't work. This is our own data of our own law that it made things worse. The DOJ put that information out and mm -hmm. that law is still in fact right now. So anyway, that's what I was bitching about. And that's the only part that they left in there, which is really unfortunate because there's so many things, like you were saying, people don't know this. They just follow the narrative of, oh, keep the porn off for, you know, no kids watching porn. Duh. But there, there's all these like underlying things where it's written poorly or it's it's actually just a narrative to, to censor the whores or, mm -hmm. you know, get the gaze out of our out of our Internet mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and, and people believe these narratives. And mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of information that unfortunately wasn't shown because it took more of a Pornhub angle. You know, I get how clicks work and I know that, you know, Netflix wanted their views and all the things. But it's unfortunate because this narrative isn't getting out there. Mm -hmm. So people don't know that we're having this financial discrimination. I tell people that I got my bank account shut down. They're like, what kind of criminal are you? And I'm like, fuck that, bro. I sell my titties on the Internet. Like, this is not a criminal. This is me selling my socks. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> But these narratives, you know, this stigma and these these this bullshit just perpetuates out into mainstream mm -hmm. and they put it in headlines and they want their clicks and all that. And then we get fucked. Yeah. We get our accounts shut down or we get censored or, you know, whatever. And it's just it's insane. Yeah, it yeah. really is. It really mm -hmm. is. Well, Ali, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, this has been a really me. interesting, really informative episode. Um, I will echo what Ali said about the Free Speech Coalition. You know, I've brought them up several times. Um, they're a really important organization to support. Um, they lobby against all these crazy legislations for us. Um, so go to freespeechcoalition.com and donate because they definitely need our support. It's very expensive um, what they are doing, and we're very, very grateful for it. Um, and then, Allie, can you tell everybody where they can find you so they can write you into their will? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> you can find me on any social network at Allie Eve Knox, um, or you can find my links through AllieKnox.com.
Perfect. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. Of course, if you want to support this podcast and watch these interviews live, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filtered. And also just go to hollylinks.com and find links to all of my platforms. I have way too fucking many of them. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us and I will see you next week.